given uh, in, in the sequence. Okay, so then uh, we have a flexibility um, also uh, concerning existence of such metrics, namely um, on simply connected manifolds, uh, there aren't any obstructions to constructing some metric of positive scalar curvature. This is uh, simply connected. And um, on the other hand, there are manifolds like exotic spheres where you do not have any positive scalar curvature metric. So this is just a kind of collection survey of some interesting results play an important role in the in the theory and um, okay so now I would like to in the rest of my talk I would like to restrict to the rigidity aspect of scalar curvature and here let's look at a particular example in dimension two namely uh, we look at the two sphere so uh, just introduce some notation. Um, I look at the n-sphere with a unit uh, with a standard metric G0, and this I uh, denote by S with this uh, kind of, uh, what is it, uh, fat notation here. And uh, so this is scalar curvature n times n minus one, the two sphere is scalar curvature two. And now let's look, um, let's put another smooth Riemannian metric on S2 whose scalar curvature is bound below by two, the scalar curvature of the standard two sphere, and which dominates uh, the usual round metric, namely, uh, yeah, you could express it in the, uh, uh, in the sense that the identity is one Lipschitz. Uh, so the identity going from Sn with the metric G to Sn to the metric G0. So um, the length of tangent vectors is not increased under this map. Um, okay, so then G is equal to G0, uh, right? So here we have a relatively weak curvature restriction because the scalar curvature is just a scalar. And um, here we have a certain uh, prescribed um, yeah, comparison or monotonicity assumption here. And then we have this pretty strong conclusion here. And this can be derived from the gauss bonnet formula since this integral here uh, does not depend on the chosen metric G. Um, so both integrals are equal to um, four pi, uh, the Euler characteristic. And so uh, we can compare these integrals. And now if we plug in these two properties here, we see that G actually has to be equal to G zero. Um, because if at some point it, uh, it is uh, strictly larger, then we get a contradiction here. Then this uh, int integral would be larger than this integral because we have this assumption also for the scalar curvature for, for the integral. And so this is a baby example, but it, it kind of directs us or it points to um, a much stronger and much more general comparison result in scalar curvature geometry that I will present next. And this is um, an interesting result by Nahul plays an important role in scalar curvature geometry. Namely, um, it is in principle the result from the previous slide, but in arbitrary dimensions. And we also can use not just the identity as comparison map between two manifolds, but arbitrary maps, uh, which are smooth and one Lipschitz. Um, so let's uh, take M to be a close, smooth, connected spin manifold of dimension at least two. Let's take a smooth Riemannian metric on M um, and assume that the scalar curvature is bound below by the scalar curvature of the n-sphere. Now we take a smooth map uh, from M to the standard round n-sphere, which is one Lipschitz with respect to the induced Riemannian distance. And we assume that the degree of F is different from zero. One possibility would be to take M equal to the n sphere with an, another met, with a metric which satisfies this property and just take the identity. This was the example from the previous slide. And then this map F is a Riemannian isometry. This is um, again a very strong conclusion under relatively weak assumptions or, a, or a seemingly weak assumptions. So this is what we call a rigidity result here. And now, in one of the previous slides, is that, is that 
Yeah, much, much harder to prove than the one that you just showed us. This, this one? Yeah, yeah. Um, I will present you the proof. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. If it doesn't take you to far astray, could you briefly explain what the square manifold is? Oh, um, yeah. I, you know what an oriented manifold is. Yes. Right. Um, so this gives a certain restriction on uh, when you take a trivialization. So you can find trivializations of the tangent space. Uh, when you pass from uh, a one trivialization to the other, the transition functions are orientation preserving. Right, so this is the definition of orientation or oriented manifold. And um, here uh, the property is that um, it's actually better than uh, being oriented, but um, you can uh, uh, put a string, uh, a spin structure on your manifold. So um, one possibility to explain is that um, yeah, so you can even kind of refine the uh, the collection of trivializations, namely in in such a way that we can define the Dirac operator later on, or uh, you can express it in terms of, of characteristic classes. Um, oriented means that uh, W1, the first people Whitney class vanishes, and spin means that also W2, the second people Whitney class vanishes. And so it's kind of closer to being trivial. It's or trivializable. It's, I mean, it's still far from trivializable, but um, you can. Uh, it it has some somewhat stronger property than just being oriented. Yeah. So um, actually, it's good that you ask because the spin condition seems to be kind of not in order. For such a statement, I mean, the statement makes complete sense without putting spin here. So the degree is defined for any oriented manifold. And this is a nuisance, actually, with this result, because nobody was able so far to lift the spin condition in this result. And um, the thing is that we uh, can, can prove this result with a um, specific method, the Dirac operator method that I explained to you in a second. And this uses the, uh, this re uh, re requires the spin condition. And this is a little strange. So somehow the pure, so the actual nature, the true nature of this result is, is not understood yet, I would say. Can it be but, in some specific dimensions? No, no, not even in dimension four. I mean, in dimension three, any oriented manifold is also spin, but in, uh, in higher dimensions, that's, that, that's not the case. And even dimension four, I don't know how so to prove this result. Yeah. It's open. Right. It might well be false. Exactly. Yes. Maybe it's false. But what were there cases with the positive mass conjecture where they required spin, where wouldn't require spin, and then then they were eliminated, right? Yeah, I mean, uh there yeah, you we have a, a second method using minimal hypersurfaces yeah. and uh, bit over, trying to find regular minimal hypersurfaces. Unfortunately, this approach doesn't work here for this comparison result. And it, in this respect, it, it, it really stands out. It's not completely parallel to the, to the positive mass theorem, yeah. where we do have versions for non-spin manifolds. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And our goal now is to generalize this to metrics which have lower regularity. And more specifically, uh, we require G of regularity to be uh, of order um, of, of sobolithic regularity W1P, where P is bigger than N. So this is exactly kind of the, the, the so P equal to N would be the critical case for having um, a continuous metric. So this, these metrics are all, always continuous and uh, by the so-called F embedding theorem. And this is what we uh, uh, assume here. But so this is, far, this is far less than C1. You are emphasizing here the F is actually scriptures, but it's not proof. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and this is uh, this is the next property that uh, we would like to um, to uh, drop the smoothness smoothness condition for for, for F. You want, you want the smoothness? Do you expect it to be smooth, or do you only expect it to be What's it's, it's No, uh, this is the, these are the, uh, the assumptions. I want to weaken the assumption. Uh, I just want to I uh, forget about smoothness. Oh yeah, you want you want you want. I just want to keep the geometry and forget about the analysis. Okay. <laughs> Some sense. So, 
Now the scalar condition is pointwise everywhere, or again, since that's the next slide. Okay. <laughs> so we have to we have to uh, define the scalar curvature. I mean, in order to uh, state a sensible uh, a theorem under these assumptions, we have to rethink the definition of scalar curvature. And one possibility to do so is to write down um, the scalar curvature in a distributional sense. This was done in a paper by Lili Floch about uh, the positive mass theorem. And I just repeat it here. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, when we work in local coordinates, then uh, we can write the scalar curvature uh, in this form where, um, uh, where these um, terms VK are linear in first derivatives of G and F is quadratic in the first derivatives of G. And uh, so the linear part, so this can be um, by taking integration by parts uh, pushed over to the other side as usual. So we, um, uh, when we take a test function U and take the integral, then we can put this, uh, uh, the partial derivative on the other side. And um, in this way, we can define uh, the scalar curvature in, in the distributional sense for metrics of this lower regularity, because then this term is still well defined. Yeah, and actually it can even be defined uh, in this way using sections whose norm squared is um, uh, L2 or uh, yeah, here, uh, if psi is uh, W of order W12. This is important because these are later on sections that we get from the Atiyah Singer index theorem in this lower regularity context here. Okay, sorry? Not to hear you, are not really using P greater or equal than greater than. Um, okay, so we would have to watch more closely um, uh, the, the Sobolev embedding. Yeah, you're probably right. This. So your, is your F, your F also contains factors that are just in terms of the metric, right? Yes. Um, I mean, you have to look very closely here. Um, right, so that's why you want it to be continuous. That's why you need the P bigger than N. So that you this is certainly a good control. idea, yeah. But because if, if it weren't just quadratic, then you would get away with H1. Right. Right. Okay, so this is the scalar curvature distribution. In particular, we can define lower scalar curvature bounds, or we can compare scalar curvatures of domain and target using this, this notion of scalar curvature. And uh, so we can uh, state the Laroult theorem for low regularity metrics and maps. Namely, again, we take a smooth connected spin manifold as before. Here, um, so was for this theorem, we have to restrict to even dimensions. I will say a few words about that later on. Uh, let's take a Riemannian metric of this low regularity. It's a little bit better than just the continuous. Uh, scalar curvature in the distributional sense is bounded below by n times n minus one. And uh, we take a map which is just one which is continuous, but it need not be smooth of non-zero degree. And then F must be a metric isometry. Okay, so actually it is not true that in any case F is um, then smooth under these conditions because you can always pull back a smooth metric along a map F, which is of low regularity to get a map which is uh, to get a metric, a pullback metric, uh, which is of regularity 1p. Um, and so this, if, if you do that, then the induced metric on the domain uh, is of course isometric to the given metric on SN under the map. So, so, this is, um, so this map need not be automatically smooth. In general, it's just a metric isometry. This is our conclusion and this is the best conclusion that we can expect here. And so in some way, we kind of stripped off some of the analysis or, or regularity. And interestingly, we are in a range of regularity, which is really below C1. And, and you, when you recall the nash kolper theorem, uh, C1 was um, uh, a regularity where we had flexibility already. And here we have rigidity in this, uh, in this setting. This, um, yeah. Uh, it's just a uh, remark here. 
And uh, so this generalization of the LaRoule re result was conjectured by Gromov in his four lectures on scalar curvature. And um, yeah, it's actually sufficient to assume G of being of regularity W1n and continuous. And uh, then after we put our paper on the archive, um, uh, another team, Vitam, uh, put a paper on the archive proving the same theorem under somewhat different assumptions on the metric, also low regularity, um, using a Ricci flow approach. And this is quite interesting uh, that we have now these two different methods, the Dirac method and a method using geometric flows to uh, approach uh, or to prove such a statement. Um, more, uh, more specifically, um, they use the Ricci flow um, on domain and target and the inverse, um, uh, so, so the harmonic uh, Matheid flow um, for the map that connects uh, that is uh, written here. And then after a nanosecond, uh, the map becomes smooth. And um, yeah, and these properties are still uh, preserved. So this is quite remarkable. So then you can uh, apply classical uh, allow it. And, um, but actually using the Dirac approach, which I will explain now, um, this uh, uh, proves such a statement under somewhat weaker assumptions, namely it is enough to assume that F is area non-increasing rather than one Lipschitz. Area non-increasing means you look at the induced map on the bundle of two forms on M, and then you have, uh, you go from the bundle of two forms on M to the bundle of two forms of on SN, mm -hmm. so this you have a natural norm uh, for uh, to so you measure or you compare um, areas of, of the surface, uh, 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 which is spanned by two vectors. So this is what we call area non-increasing. So we, um, we replace this property by this the weaker property, and the uh, Dirac approach uh, just requires this property, uh, whereas uh, for the uh, uh, geometric flow approach, this seems to be difficult at present. Yeah, so there's a small distinction which, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that it's there and uh, we certainly will have a closer look at, at the two methods and how they compare. Okay, so now, um, so proving this theorem here, this will be now the topic of the rest of my talk and I will point out some analogies of the classical proof of La Roule, and then uh, an additional difficulty appears, and this is where we have to use or we have to borrow um, something from a part in the analysis which was so far not used in spin geometry. Um, okay, so we need two ingredients to prove such a theorem, and this is a kind of blueprint for many comparison results in scalar curvature geometry, at least if we use the spinner approach or the Dirac operator approach. So this is, you can maybe view this as a general introduction to the method. Namely, um, so if you have a spin manifold, then you have the uh, spin principal bundle uh, um, over your manifold and you can take an associated bundle um, by, uh, um, taking an irreducible spin representation in even dimensions, there is just one complex irreducible spin representation, uh, which is graded. So we have a plus and minus part and you take this bundle. This is a certain vector bundle over your original manifold M and uh, it has a plus and minus part. So this is what we remember here. Uh, for technical reasons, um, if we work with lower regularity metrics, then it's somewhat inconvenient to define the spinner bundle or the or the spin frame bundle for a uh, low regularity metric. So we can do this for some fixed smooth background metric gamma. In the smooth context, in the classical Yarul theorem, we don't need to do that. So we can work with a given metric, but here we use some smooth background metrics. This is just a technical um, detail and we can actually ignore it more or less here. And then we take a remaining metric of lower regularity. Um, and then I um, look at 
uh, what we call the twisted Dirac operator. So this um, takes sections in the um, tensor product of my spinner bundle S with this twist bundle, as we called it E, it's so just a mm -hmm. Lipschitz vector bundle. So the transition functions are just Lipschitz, no, not smooth, with a metric connection. And so let's take a section over M, which uh, with values in the tensor product of this um, spinner bundle and this emission twist bundle. So in the twisted Dirac operator now um, is constructed as follows. Here we have certain input data, namely the metric G and this twist bundle E. And then we can uh, construct on this bundle uh, the an induced connection, spinner connection. So, and then we take this, this uh, formula here, we take uh, a low, local orthonormal frame, E1 up to En. We take the um, uh, yeah, covariant derivative in the different directions Ei, and then we take the Clifford multiplication with Ei in this bundle, gamma. So this little g here means that we, um, yeah, we have to take, so, so this is a local orthonormal frame with respect to the metric gamma, and we can uh, kind of compute out of this a local orthonormal frame for the metric little g. So this is uh, what we use here. And so this defines um, a, a differential operator of order one on the... Uh, are you using the little g even on the other side? Or am I... Yeah. I mean, but even when even even the other EI that appears over there. This one? Yeah, this one is also orthonormal with respect to G, right? Uh, no, in this setting, uh, actually, so so this point, yeah, okay. I, I knew that this will co cause confusion, but I wanted to be precise. So this point here, this is the Clifford multiplication in this bundle, in the spinner bundle for the metric gamma, and we take a, uh, we take a local orthonormal frame for the metric gamma here. This is this E1 up to En. But in this uh, part of the formula, we have to take a local orthonormal frame with respect to the metric G. So this makes the formula right. If you, um, if you compare uh, the Dirac operator with respect to two different metrics, um, I mean, you can, for example, if you have two smooth metrics, you can work in the spinner bundle with respect to the first metric and uh, still write the Dirac operator in this way. So you take the, the uh, spinner connection for the other metric, and then you have to take the uh, here a local orthonormal frame for the other metric, which is computed out of this metric by the usual comparison between the two metrics, um, G and G prime. So, um, I mean, here, um, I could have written, but this would have not been uh, completely precise, uh, we just take the metric G and we take the spinner bundle for the metric G. But here, here we have to be a little bit more careful for technical reasons. And okay, so this um, uh, uh, gives us sort of from the Lipschitz sections. Um, so recall that each Lipschitz function is almost everywhere differentiable with um, uh, essentially bounded result. And so, because we have a closed manifold, which is compact, we can plug in a Lipschitz section here and we get out for, for sure an L2 section in our bundle. The Lipschitz section, so they are dense in the uh, L2 space, the space of L2 sections. And um, so we can try to run the usual machinery of spectral geometry, and uh, for example, it is true that this operator is essentially self-adjoint, um, similarly as the classical Dirac operator when we use a smooth metric here or, and a smooth um, uh, twisting bundle. And uh, so we can look at its uh, self-adjoint extension. Um, it has domain DH1 sections in this space here. And uh, so we get, um, operate an operator from H1 sections to the L2 sections of this bundle S tensor E, and it uh, swaps the uh, the grading, the parity. So we have a plus and minus part, and this goes to the minus and plus part, because here we have a Clifford multiplication. And uh, so it turns out that this is a Friedholm operator, and it uh, satisfies the unique index formula. So this is the first ingredient. 
Of course, so the, we took the classical index formula and what Cecchini, myself, and Chick CHS contributed, uh, we, uh, yeah, we wrote down that this situation can be basically homotopy. We have a, a, a continuous path of such operators and it turns out that they're all freight home and then, then we use the... And you see you show the, 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 the lack of regularity that, that they usually assume doesn't bother you, right? Exactly. Yes, so, so this, is, this is more or less straightforward, but it's good to, to have it, and this is what we what we get here. Um, but some is things... That, are, is that the borderline? I mean, hard to tell. I mean, it's not so... For example, we do not have a regularity in the sense that each section in the kernel of this, um, of this operator must be smooth, as in the classical case. It doesn't even make sense because the bundle is, is just a Lipschitz bundle. And we cannot even tell uh, that every element in the kernel is Lipschitz, unfortunately. So, so here we have some differences in this regularity uh, or elliptic regularity, but uh, it works just as we need it. And this is, um, uh, yeah, this is good to, to have it uh, written down like this. Okay, so then we have the second ingredient for our meal, and this is the schrodinger lenebovich formula. Um, and this gives the connection between the scalar curvature geometry and the spectral geometry uh, of the Dirac operator. And this, this formula actually allows us to use the Dirac operator to uh, prove any results in scalar curvature geometry. And this is... Um, uh, so let me state it here in the in, in the version that we need. Namely, um, let's start with a smooth Hermitian vector bundle with, with metric connection on some manifold N. I take a Lipschitz continuous map from another smooth, from a given manifold M to N. For example, this could be the N sphere. And I take the pullback bundle under this map, the pullback bundle E um, on N. This is just a Lipschitz bundle. And in the Lichnevovich formula, the curvature of the twist bundle appears, but for Lipschitz bundles, we cannot define curvature normally because curvature and you uh, require second derivatives. But here we can uh, just pull back the curvature of the target bundle um, under this Lipschitz map, so we get a um, L infinity section of the two um, form bundle uh, with values in the endomorphism bundle of E. And we might call this the curvature of E. So we just pull back the curvature of the, of the, the well-defined curvature of E0 under this Lipschitz map or under the differential of this Lipschitz map. This is why we get an L infinity section here. And this is what I call the curvature of E. And okay, so here we uh, define a specific curvature operate an endomorphism uh, valued a section um, for um, uh, the bundle S tensor E. I write this down here because this is what um, appears here in the Lichnerovich formula. And the Lichnerovich formula says that if you have um, an H1 section in your um, twisted spinner bundle, and you apply the Dirac operator from the previous slide to it, then we can take the L2 norm squared. And this can be computed um, as written on the right-hand side. We have two, three different sum ends. The first one is the L2 norm squared of the covariant derivative. So we have the spinner connection, as I told you before. Um, the second term, this involves the scalar curvature in the distributional sense, because we um, are of low regularity, applied to the norm squared of, of psi. And the last term involves the, this, this curvature operator applied to psi, and then we take the inner product with psi. So the classical Lichnerovich formula, this doesn't take inner products. So in the classical way, we take the, um, the square of the Dirac operator, de squared of psi, is equal to, then we take the square of the covariant derivative applied to psi. The second term is one fourth of the scalar curvature. And the last term is this um, endomorphism applied to the section psi. 
but uh, the scalar curvature is only defined in the distributional sense anyway. So that such a formula doesn't make sense point-wise. And uh, so this forces us to write down a formula like this, an integral Lichnevich formula, and this is actually true. So this holds. This is good. And uh, okay, so the untwisted case without this term, this is again contained in Lili Floch's paper. And uh, for the twisted case, we ap approximate f by, by smooth functions and work with the classical formula. Um, so this requires some work, but it's also relatively straightforward to achieve it. And so we have now this formula for the norm squared of Dirac operator applied to Psi. And in particular, if we find a section Psi, which lies in the kernel of the Dirac operator, then the left-hand side is zero. And this tells us that each term on the right-hand side must also be zero. Uh, so this will be um, uh, written later on. And but this is kind of the general method how we derive uh, conclusions in scalar poetry geometry from that. Uh, so let me um, go back a little bit into the history of science. Namely, um, it is interesting to trace where the Lignerovich formula was first written down. And this is this paper by Schrödinger uh, from 1932. Um, and I mean, this formula has different names. Some people call it the Weizenberg formula. Some people call it the Lignerovich Weizenberg formula. But I really, uh, yeah suggest to call it the Schrödinger, maybe schrodinger lichnerovich formula, because in this paper he uh, wrote down, he computed the square of the Dirac operator. Actually, he plugs in an eigenfunction or eigen section of the Dirac operator uh, with eigen value mu. So on the right-hand side, we have mu squared. And on the left-hand side, we have exactly the terms that appeared on the previous slide. Here we have the square of the um, a spinner connection. Here we have the scalar curvature term over four, and here we have a curvature of some twist bundle. Actually, this this formula is computed locally in this paper, so uh, Schrödinger does, does not work on global globally defined bundles. And actually, the, the the phrase spinner geometry was not available at this at this moment. So it's really remarkable that he found. Uh, this or uh, wrote this formula, and actually he writes that um, yeah, the second summand seems to be of um, particular interest, particular theoretical interest. Yeah, so this is the scalar culture term that we like. Okay, so this is um, uh, the first uh, instance where the uh, Schrödinger Lichnerovich formula was written down. Okay, so how do we prove theorem A? using our ingredients. Uh, recall the statement. We want to prove that if we have an even dimensional spin manifold, we have a metric of low regularity uh, with lower scalar curvature bound, and we have a one Lipschitz map of non-zero degree, then F must be a metric isometry. Okay, as before, I take the um, spinner bundle over M, then I have uh, the spinner bundle over SM for the standard metric, and I pull back this bundle along F to get a Lipschitz spinner bundle over M. So I write down then the twisted Dirac operator for this situation. I apply the Atiyah Singer index formula. And this tells me that the index is equal to the Euler characteristic of SM times the degree of F. Because we are in even dimensions, this is good. The Euler characteristic is different from zero. The degree is different from zero by assumption. So the index is different from zero. And because the operator self adjoined, so index is the um, dimension of the kernel minus dimension of the co kernel. Because the operator is uh, self adjoined, this means we find elements in the kernel of this operator. So um, we find a spinner, uh, a section, an H1 section in this bundle, which lies in the kernel of this twisted Dirac operator that I've written down here. Now we write the schrodinger lichnerovich formula in this situation. So Dirac applied to the spinner is zero. So we get zero here. And this is the right-hand side from before. Let's evaluate it. So this is bound below by zero. This is clear because it's a square. The second term is bounded. Um, so this part is bounded below by n times n minus one times L2 norm squared of phi. Uh, this is this assumption here. How about the last term? Yeah, it turns out that this is 
bounded below by minus one over four n times n minus one L, the L2 norm of psi x squared. And this means that uh, the only um, way that this can hold is that, um, yeah, uh, we have equality everywhere. So we are in the limit situation. And in particular, the scalar curvature of G has to be equal to n times n minus one in the distributional sense. And then we have this last term here, which, um, which also tells us, okay, um, this, um, this inner product must be equal, exactly equal to one fourth minus one fourth times n times n minus one uh, L2 norm psi squared. And uh, so from this property here, we can derive that uh, F, the original map F um, has to be an isometry, but not quite. And this will create a lot of trouble as we will see uh, on a later slide. Um, so let's compute, let's look at this last term, this curvature term. So this term is, as I said, told you, bounded below by one fourth minus one fourth times n times n minus one norm of omega squared for any spinner, for any, so you take a point in your manifold and you just take uh, a, a point in S tensor E in this bundle or the fiber of this bundle over X. And Yavul also has a characterization of the equality case, namely equality occurs if and only if the, um, this differential of F, which is almost everywhere defined, it's a Lipschitz map, is an isometry from the tangent space of M to the tangent space of S. And uh, we have a second property, which is a little bit more complicated to write down. Um, so this element omega must lie in the plus one eigenspace of a certain uh, self-adjoint involution, which is defined by the Clifford multiplications on M and on the target manifold Sn. So let's at first concentrate on this property here. So this, these are the three um, properties that we get here. So the, the, uh, the norm of psi has to be constant since as we see here, this has to be zero, though the covariant, covariant derivative is zero. Then uh, the scalar curvature has to be constant n times n minus one in the distributional sense. This is the second term in the Lichnerovich formula. And in the last term, we see that the differential of f has to be an isometry almost everywhere. This is what we conclude at this point. Using a combination of the Atiyah Singer index theorem, which yields an harmonic spinner. Um, of regularity together with the integral Lichnerovich formula. And from this, we can, of course, conclude and this proves the classical Yahul theorem. If F is smooth, then F must be a Riemannian isometry. Why? Okay, because this is an isometry, we can use the inverse function theorem. We see that F is locally a diffeomorphism. <laughs> And then we see, aha, uh, it's a local in a diffeomorphism. Sn is simply connected, so it must be global diffeomorphism. And uh, this map is almost everywhere in isometry. So actually, the map must be everywhere in isometry because this, the differential of f is continuous if we are in, in the smooth case. So in the smooth case, um, everything is fine. But let's think, OK, if we are not in the smooth case, can we draw the same conclusion or not? This is the big question now. Okay, so this is the question of the problem. You have um, two manifolds. This is on the next slide. Um, you have a man two manifolds and you have a map between them, let's say even between the two spheres, Sn, and um, assume, you, so this map is Lipschitz, and the differential is an isometry almost everywhere. Is F a metric isometry or not? And um, yeah, of course you hope, yeah, maybe it is and, and so on so that we can complete our proof, but it's not so easy because the inverse function theorem is not true in this generality. And an easy counterexample is this one. So you take the map from the n sphere to the n sphere, which is the identity on the lower hemisphere, you could just take S1 here, and the upper hemisphere is mapped to the lower hemisphere, but just by um, uh, yeah, uh, projection or um, yeah, this uh, flipped map 
here. So this map is one Lipschitz mm -hmm. isometry almost everywhere, but it's not a metric isometry, it's this map here. Right, so this tells us, okay, this, the conclusion that we get here, that the, uh, the differential E at is almost everywhere in isometry. This is the conclusion that we get from the classical Yarul argument. This is not quite sufficient to conclude our proof. This is really an important point here in this whole discussion because we have these cold maps like this one. Of course, this map doesn't have degree one, I admit, but of course we have to kind of keep the logic correct for our argument here. And um, at least this conclusion alone that the F is almost everywhere in isometry, the differential is not sufficient to prove that F must be a metric isometry. This is not just not true. So this is the problem here. And uh, so actually this took re us really a while to see what can we do. So, so, so what, what other ingredient can we use here? And then we luckily found that in a different part of um, classical analysis, there are results that help us out of this, of this difficulty here. Namely, we can um, prove that um, the only obstruction to being a metric isometry under these assumptions is actually this fold property. So this, this must be avoided. And so the following theorem holds if you have uh, oriented smooth simply connected <laughs> manifolds or targets simply connected, you take continuous Riemannian metrics so that we get um, uh, uh, still Riemannian distance functions, the, the G and the H, and then you take a proper local Lipschitz continuous map. If, if the manifolds are compact, then forget about the proper. And then equivalent are that F is a metric isometry. This is what we want. And that the F is an isometry almost everywhere, but the F must also be orientation preserving almost everywhere. This is exactly what fails in this previous example, right? So, so this, I mean, once you have an example, you, you hope, okay, maybe this is the only problem. And it, this is actually true, this is the case, but why? Why is this true? Um, under these assumptions, it turns out that F must be a homeomorphism. And this will be proven on the next slide. And once we know that F is a homeomorphism, then you can uh, use standard length comparison arguments um, uh, be between domain and target to compare these uh, two distance functions. So then this is fine, but we have to somehow prove that F is a homeomorphism. And this uses the, uh, the theory of, of quasi-regular maps that we can use here. And um, yeah, so it was actually really uh, quite revealing for me that, um, I mean, there's, that there's such a well-developed theory that I wasn't really aware of before. Uh, so it's, it's good that there are well-written books. And um, yeah, so this is this book by Rittman, which I like a lot and where all this theory is explained. Um, probably you know the theory better than I do, but let's just recall the, um, the basic notions. We call a map, um, which is defined on an open connected subset of uh, Rn to Rn, K quasi-regular, if it has this regularity, which is exactly what we need, W1n uh, intersected with C0, or W1p would also be enough, of course. And then uh, we have a certain inequality which measures the distortion of the map, like in the field of quasi-regular, uh, quasi-conformal mappings. And you can measure the distortion uh, by taking the, uh, the norm of the map to the n, and you compare it to the de determinant of the differential of n. <laughs> and in particular, um, okay, so the, the formula says or the, the requirement is that you have such an inequality with some number, fixed number k, almost everywhere. Of course, you can always pass to a larger k if, if we have such a formula, but in general, not to a lower one. So you could think of k as the, as the uh, best possible here. This is the distortion parameter. And this is just uh, a general, generalization of quasi conformal mappings. Uh, the only thing is that we do not restrict to homeomorphisms, but, but we restrict to, to arbitrary maps of this regularity. Okay, so we have uh, typical examples like complex analytic maps are one quasi-regular, 
And if you take the map, um, you, you take a cylinder and in the, uh, so phi is the angle parameter of the, uh, of, of, of the plane of the cylinder and R is the radial parameter. So we have polar coordinates here. And um, then you multiply the angle parameter by K. So you wrap it around K times. This map is K squared. But regular, it's of course not smooth in the origin along the axis. And here we see a kind of branching behavior. So this map is not a homeomorphism. This is K, quasi uh, K squared quasi regular. And here we have a fundamental result which tells us that uh, this branching does not occur once we can make sure that K is very small. Uh, it's just a very small distance away from one. And this is um, uh, this uh, theorem here, written here, proven by several people over the years. Uh, once we are in dimension at least three, there is um, K bigger than one, which is usually very small, uh, or very close to one, such that each non-constant K cross regular map is a local homeomorphism. Uh, so in this case here, for example, K must be smaller than K squared because, <laughs> because otherwise we would have this counterexample. But if you require that the that this uh, the distortion is really small enough, then there is no room for branching loci. And uh, we can conclude that the map is a local homeomorphism. And this is exactly what we need. In particular, this property is fulfilled for trivial reasons if the differential of F is almost everywhere in isometry. I mean, this sounds a little weird or funny because then this property holds for K equal one even. Yes. But, but, but even then, uh, this theorem is not trivial to prove, right? So we, but we can readily use it. Otherwise we, um, and we need, I mean, here I, I should tell you that um, here we don't have um, absolute value signs. So um, implicit in this definition is that if say F is almost everywhere in isometry, then uh, so this um, uh, thing here is positive. And this means that the determinant has to be positive almost everywhere. So F has to be orientation preserving almost everywhere. This is implicit in this definition here. If, if the left-hand side is different from zero, because then the right-hand side, um, yeah, so it must also be positive. Um, okay, so this is the, the, the third ingredient that we need in order to conclude the proof for um, in, in our case. So we just have to make sure that the F is orientation preserving, because then we can, uh, then, then we know that F is a local homeomorphism. How do we prove that the F is orientation preserving? So for this, we have to go back to the Dirac geometry. And um, in fact, it turns out that in theorem A, the uh, F must be orientation preserving almost everywhere. It's not just an isometry almost everywhere, but it must also be orientation preserving almost everywhere. And this hasn't been noticed in the literature so far. Um, and for this, we need um, uh, another property of these extremal spinners that I have neglected somewhat before because it, it looks a bit technical, but this is exactly the property that we need, sorry, um, in order to make sure that, um, so we plug in uh, an ex this extremal spinner psi that we get from the Atiyah Singer index theorem. And in the extremal case, Yahoo tells us that almost everywhere, this equality holds. So this is in the plus one eigenspace of a certain self-adjoint involution defined by Clifford multiplication. And from that, one can conclude that F must be orientation preserving or orientation reversing almost everywhere. And for this one assumes that um, there are two subsets of positive measure of, uh, uh, over one of which the F is orientation preserving, over the other is orientation reversing. And then one can derive a contradiction from that using this property. So this I have written on, on the slide, I will skip it, but this finishes the proof of the low regularity Yahoo theorem. And instead of um, uh, uh, explaining this proof in detail, I would like to give you an, uh, an application of this low regularity Yahoo result. Because you might wonder, okay, why, 
is this interesting apart from, of course, you want to generalize your theorems, but we can draw conclusions <laughs> or smooth manifolds and smooth comparison maps using this low regularity uh, comparison principle that I proved here. Namely, um, we can prove a comparison principle for hemispheres rather than spheres in, in the following way. Take um, the um, usual ball, dn, and take some smooth Riemannian metric on dn, uh, whose scalar curvature is bounded below by n times n minus 1. And we also assume that the boundary is mean convex with respect to the interior normal, like when you take the usual um, unit ball and this property is fulfilled. It's mean convex. And now let's take a map um, of this hemisphere to the n sphere, which is one Lipschitz continuous. I mean, you can take a smooth map even, then it's still non trivial. Let's take a smooth map, which is one Lipschitz continuous or just any map. And um, we assume that the boundary of this disk um, is mapped to the southern hemisphere. This is one property. And the map of pairs, dn goes to sn, and the boundary goes to the lower hemisphere, is of non-zero degree. So in other words, you take this um, hemisphere, you take the ball, and wrap it around a unit sphere, such so that, that the boundary of this ball um, lands on the uh, southern hemisphere of the unit sphere. This is what we do. And under these assumptions, um, the image of F must be the upper hemisphere, and F is actually a smooth Riemannian isometry. Yeah, so um, we can just apply theorem A to the following situation. You, know, you take the double of this um, domain manifold of this ball, and uh, your metric G, so we have a smooth Riemannian metric G, um, then it uses a, a metric of lower regularity. I mean, when you take the ball with some smooth metric and you take the double and take the, just the two metrics on this manifold, then along the bluing region, it's no longer smooth, but it's li still Lipschitz or of regularity double one P. So this is, this is fine. And uh, then we take a map from this double to SN by, um, as follows, on the left-hand side, we take the original map F, and for the right-hand copy, we take also the map F, but um, composed with this funny map, <laughs> which leaves the southern hemisphere as it is and flips the northern hemisphere to, to the southern hemisphere. So this means that the image of this map is the southern hemisphere, and F is this original map here, and both maps are glued together nicely because the boundary of, um, of this disk is mapped to the southern hemisphere. So this is compatible. Okay, so then we apply theorem A to this situation. We get an induced map, which is one Lipschitz. Here we have a Lipschitz metric, or a metric of, of regularity W1P. And um, theorem A says, okay, this map must be a metric isometry. Then we can restrict this map to the original domain DN. It's metric isometry, but here we have a smooth Riemannian metric. And now we use the map of Steenrod Myers that if you have two smooth Riemannian manifolds and you have a metric isometry be between them, this must be a smooth Riemannian isometry. And uh, what I would like to remark here is we do not use any Dirac geometry or spinner geometry uh, for manifolds with boundaries. So we do not solve boundary problems, yeah, boundary value problems in the Atiyah Singer index theorem, but we just pass to a double and then we apply the original theorem. And um, there is an, this approach using boundary value problems and um, uh, corresponding uh, index theorems, uh, for example, by uh, John Lott, uh, we know that if uh, we have the additional assumption that the uh, boundary of the disk is mapped to the equator sphere, 
and the image of the map is the upper hemisphere, then this map must be a Riemannian isometry. But these conditions can be weakened here. So I do not require that the end is mapped to the other upper hemisphere. It can be mapped anywhere. And the boundary just must be mapped to the southern hemisphere. Okay, so this is an, um, an application in classical Riemannian geometry, which uses these low regularity results that I uh, that I proved before. And so this shows that, I mean, even for these uh, theorems like this, it's a useful result. And uh, so at this point, I would like to thank you for your attention. Questions? Okay, is there a fault that doesn't use in geometry in this result? Or do you have the snippet version of it? Uh, sorry, I, I cannot hear you. So you can prove the, the two-dimensional version of this with gauss Bonnet, and then you use spin geometry in higher dimension. Yeah, I mean, in two dimensions, all every oriented manifold is, uh, is uh, uh, a spin. But actually, this you may regard this as an exercise to prove the Laroule theorem in dimension two using gauss Bonnet and not the spin geometry. It's not that easy. Right, because the map, uh, you, you, I mean, you just know that the map is of non-zero degree, but it can be orientation reversing or preserving. So you do not know exactly what happens with the volume element when you pull it back. So it's, no, it's, 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 it's not completely obvious, but it can be done. But you are right in, uh, so, so the, the spinner approach or spin geometry approach, this works in any dimension, whereas uh, we do not have uh, a generalization of the, of the, um, Gauss-Bonnet theorem for higher dimensions that could be used here. So, so it's a uh, oh, like, like S3 where you where everything uh, right? Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> so even there, there's no there's no non-spin. I do not know of any non-spin approach in dimension three. Of course, it is likely that we could use Ricci flow method, geometric flows, maybe with surgery in this dimension. So, which is very well understood. And this, I think this would be quite worthwhile to work out, even though in this dimension, the theorem is known already, but for understanding the mathematics behind it, uh, it would be a good idea to do, to, to do that. Are you sure you, know, you need the uh, quasi-regular mapping actually to conclude? I mean, I know that Reshatniak, before the theorem that you're quoting, has the following rigidity theorem, which looks very much like what you need. So if you have a W1N map from Rn to Rn, okay. and it takes, and the differential takes value in SON almost everywhere, mm -hmm. which is literally yes. your condition, like, you know, yeah. addition preserving part plus being, mm -hmm. then it's a single, it's right. a single element of SON plus a, plus a translation. So he does that directly without passing through. Passing okay, through. yeah, I'm, I was a little confused actually um, and, and looked in the literature. Um, I mean, people have worked out mm -hmm. things like that uh, for uh, Romanian manifolds passing to local um, coordinates. Okay. And then you always have a slight, um, yeah. Uh, so the, the maps are not uh, no longer in SON. If, if yeah, yeah, no, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, um, yeah, there's maybe some technical detail. Right, that. this is what I, I mean, I think that's basically all what's behind that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I completely agree with you. If, if we worked on RN, then we can use this, this classical result. And if you yeah. work on arbitrary many manifolds, I think this is a neat way to make yeah. logic. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I understand. I mean, maybe if that's you just get, maybe if you just get uh, a local version of that, of that theorem of that's probably. Not impossible. Yeah, I mean, but this is basically, okay. what it's, it's, I think it's more or less what's written on the on the slide, because you can always find a local coordinates uh, where you have um, where the map are almost isometrics, the induced maps in these coordinates. Mm -hmm. You take a, a point, and then you, yeah, you can take adapted coordinates in, in domain and target, so that the uh, induced differential is not uh, an isometry, but almost a isometry. Okay. Of, you can make the epsilon as small as you wish, and then you are in this in this regime. Of, okay, okay, of then the okay, then okay, but then then it's not going to be easier than the theorem that you're claiming because there's this um, 
Friseke James Müller result, which tells you that if the differential is L2 close to mm -hmm. SON, uh -huh. then you're actually L2 close to a constant. Okay. And actually that Friseke James Müller theorem works with, with any LP. <laughs> so okay. if you leave sheets and you're close to, to Interesting. SON, yeah. then actually you are your map W1P is W1P close to a single to a single S1 plus the constant, and then it would it would Okay, interesting. I, I wasn't aware of this result. And then yeah. probably like, yeah, yeah, okay. But I mean at that point, that theorem is not easy to prove. I'm not sure it's easier to prove than the <laughs> theory of as a regular methods. Uh, is that in the field? Okay, what methods are used to prove such a theorem? Uh, well, you use, I mean, they use PDE methods. Okay. I mean, essentially, because because the Shetnyat comes with a compactness section. Mm -hmm. So if you want, I mean, if you just want an epsilon delta, actually, the Shetnyat already comes with a compactness. So okay. you know that if you're if you're in an integral sense, epsilon close to be SON, then you're epsilon close to a single matrix of SON. Okay. And then, okay, I mean, the subtlety of that theorem, which is probably already enough for what you're doing. I mean, the, sub the subtlety of their theorem is just to get actually the linear estimate between the two rigidity. I mean, really like, you know, the, 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 the L2 distance to a constant is bounded by the L2 distance to SON. Okay, there you have to work. I mean, you, yes. there's a neat PDA argument actually. Yeah. Yeah, but, but <clears throat> yeah, okay, but, but yeah, Reshetniak has, has even epsilon delta versions, which might be good. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's... Yes, no, it's very... Uh, it's useful because, I mean, because, because, because the, the quasi-regular... The theory of quasi-regular mapping is a party one. <laughs> the theorem of Reshetniak, I think, is much easier to prove. The one that I'm claiming, I mean, the one that tells you you have a sequence, it's essentially a compactness argument. I mean, you have a sequence of maps which are W1N close to the SON almost mm -hmm. everywhere, right? I mean, you just compute the distance to SON, yeah. you, you elevate to the power N, and you assuming that one converges to zero, then your map is converging strongly to a single isometry of, uh, of RN. And so I mean, maybe this might help you with, with you know, okay. the fact that okay. you have no Okay, so I have to look at the results. Uh, but, uh, I would be happy to to just the sure the curiosity. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure, sure it's worth for it for your work. I mean, still, yeah. Do your quasi-regular mapping is anyway very classical thing. It's, it's a, it's and especially, I mean, I was really amazed about the book by Rickman. It's so well written, especially when you are not working in the field and you, as myself, I, I needed to learn about it, and then one, uh, we're looking for particular results. It's often not the case that when you do that and you go into another field and you look at the um, textbooks there, it's often written in a language that you don't understand and you don't quite see what it's about. But, but in this case, I really have to say that's uh, wonderful. And this really helps to, to spread the theory to other fields, as in this case. So um, in all your results, kind of you always discuss the case where you map into the sphere with the one metric. So do these questions also make sense if you map into other targets, maybe with constant scalar curvature, like Lie yeah. groups or? Um, I mean, there are general, this is not well understood for which manifolds exactly the, uh, uh, the theorem holds. Um, so there is a generalization if the target manifold has a non-negative curvature operator. And um, so this is due to Goethe and Semmelmann. Then you can use basically the same methods. But it's so these comparison results uh, here. It's I mean, for example, when you took um, when you're just in the in the flat case, so you take Euclidean space, then this is of course not true because then you can take take any yeah shrinking map or something. So it's not an isometry. So so it's some curvature condition must be uh, must hold in the target some positivity and or non-negative uh, positivity and the and the property in, in these generalizations is the the um, uh, curvature operator is not negative and the sectional curvature actually has to be positive so this is we have generalizations like this but it's not understood where the borderline of such results really lies
Well, I guess there are no more questions. Thank you.